Well, good day. Good day. How are you? I am Zell Zelazel, the Zelazel, and of course, welcome to Amateur Apologetics. Today we have, of course, Lunar Smiles, my dear sibling, and my bro from another mo, though, <laughs> uh, Adam, or <laughs> aka Yellowhammer503, or 50tree, depending on how you want to say it. How do you say it, Adam? I don't actually know. <laughs> Tree? I just say tree. I think tree, like, like, uh, since the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. 50 tree. So there you go. There yeah. you go. Because I didn't know if you're like 50 tree or 50 tree or, yeah. I, I assumed 50 mm -hmm. tree because, anyway, it's just, just curious. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, welcome again, uh, to um, Amateur Apologetics. We've missed, uh, Adam, uh, the past uh, few weeks, which is fine. Um, we're yes. kind of hitting up into uh, Matthew 17, but I figured we'd go over what was kind of gone through the past couple weeks, which I like to do anyway, just to kind of get myself even into the, what did happen last time and in the whole Jesus story thing. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I thought. I haven't gotten that far into Genshin Impact. I, I just, uh, look, fundamentally one of the reasons, just for those who don't know, the primary reason why I haven't been as active streaming and everything like that is because I just haven't really been playing games with other people. I'm kind of over playing solo games myself, like, and that's probably been pretty true to form for most of my life. Um, there was a period where I just kind of dived in and was just kind of soloing it. But yeah, I just, I, uh, there's nothing that, that holds my attention more than other people. And I enjoy something like this where I actually get a chance to, uh, chat with people, things I'm passionate about and everything like that. And so today we're going to be continuing our reading of the book of Matthew. Um, let's just quickly go through um, what we've read recently. What was the last thing that you remember happening there, Adam? Do you remember John the John the Baptist being beheaded? Um, I don't remember that I think I think this is probably where we where we stopped with you or the last time. I'll just double check on what was before this. The parables and everything like that, parable of the sower. Did we go through that at all? I think we did. Mm -hmm. Parable store. Yeah. So basically what Jesus has done here, and you'll see an actual pattern happening um, throughout this, throughout the book that ends up, it, the way it's been structured by Matthew um, is there's sort of a, a history or something, an event that's been hap that happens, which in this case, it was the, um, the birth of Jesus and, you know, his um, immaculate conception, you know, you know, getting... Uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, that sort of thing. And then it sort of goes through a few events that um, sanctify or authenticate his, uh, his ministry to come. And then he starts doing these teachings. And so one of the types of teachings that he does is the parables. And so parables are very sort of short stories or short, um, um, what would you say? lessons i suppose in a in a practical or metaphorical sense and so the most one of the most popular the one that i remember the most is the parable of the sower which is this idea of there's this farmer guy who goes around with a bunch of seed and he starts tossing it everywhere and the seed itself the principle behind the story is that the seed itself always has the capacity for life it always has it's always good seed it, it's going to grow corn or whatever it is right corn's going to come up no matter what the question is whether the soil that it falls upon is good enough to receive the good seed. So the idea is that the seed is representative of truth or the, the, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, um, that sort of thing. And those who receive it are the soil. And so it could be rocky soil where, you know, certain things like they just won't take. There's no root that's possible or that animals come by and swoop it up. And so... Um, in the same way, you know, if it's on good soil, then good crops will come up and you'll, you'll get what is expected based on the seed sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of the, the setup. Boy, AI chatbot is up there. Hey, San Jade Salamander, how's it going, man? Welcome in, welcome in. Um, so anyway, so he goes through a, a bunch of parables and he kind of explains why he uses them. And the, the essential, the essential, you know, the gist of it is that He's, he's already shown his his ability to to preach, to give good lessons, to heal the sick, to cast out demons and stuff like that. But when it comes to the truth and about who he is, even if you were to tell those who are hard hearted or or unwilling to even listen, um, he 
if he were to tell them straight up, they would just reject them outright. And so he tells the the stories or these parables to make people actually think and bypass this automatic bias if they have the wisdom or the openness to do so. And that's and that's kind of what he talks about here is for their their for this people's hearts have grown callous their ears are hard of hearing and their eye uh, they have shut their eyes otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears understand with their hearts and turn back and I would cure them and saying that what he gives and what what his lessons are are the way through which you can grow and where life actually is kind of thing so um, so yeah that's uh, that's kind of his explanation. And so he goes through a series of different parables, um, a bunch of different metaphors, if you will, um, on the type of people that exist in the land, the um, type of people who are wise to to implement things, um, the way in which the kingdom itself is like that he is proposing where, you know, people think that a kingdom has to be violent and it has to be like this big army and crash through and, and flatten everything and then plant itself in these large stones. Well, he gives a metaphor of this mustard seed, the mustard seed in that area anyway, is the smallest of all seeds. And yet the smallest seed when planted can grow into a mighty tree. And that's what the kingdom he's proposing, the kingdom of God is going to be like is um is like a mustard seed and that it starts with just one seed that you can become this mighty tree sort of thing um and then he goes goes forward and starts kind of explaining to his closest uh friends what exactly his parables really mean under the surface so i'm kind of i'm very i'm be, you know being very um cur uh, you know cursory and, and just quick quick to uh, explain some of these things so um so that's kind of what we did. Um, John the Baptist was, uh, you know, thought to be one of the the best preachers of his time. He's a very weird kind of outcast. He's the equivalent of like the the homeless guy on the street corner with a uh, a sign saying the end is nigh in one sense. But he was actually very po uh, powerful and um, believable in his um, in his preaching. And basically the reason why he ends up getting put in jail by Herod um, is that Herod essentially takes on his brother Philip's wife um, and so basically says well I'm gonna take your wife and she's gonna be my wife now which was a which was just sinful and 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 you know not very cool and so he basically calls him out on it. it's like yeah you shouldn't be doing that that's wrong and because he said that Herodias um, which is uh, his brother Philip's wife basically complains Herod says fine and then throws him in jail and well basically he uh, gives a promise to Herodias's daughter that she can have anything because he uh, or she pleased him and all of his guests with a a very fancy dance we'll call it like a burlesque practically and uh, yeah Herodias' daughter basically says, give me the head of John the Baptist and kind of to honor uh, her mother or, you know, to, to follow through with her. And so he was beheaded, um, which, of course, sucked. But uh, that'll come in later. Um, Jesus also goes around doing these really amazing miracles. Um, he does it a couple of times. He feeds the 5,000 um, with a few fish and a few loaves of bread and he feeds... I think it's 4,000 with, again, like, I think it's five fish and two loaves of bread or something like that. Um, and so he's he's showing that he can physically provide people, and it's kind of harkening back to the old stories of the manna from heaven in the Old Testament, where um, God delivered his people, the Jewish people, from Egypt, uh, from slavery, and then provided them, gave them enough bread, manna, from heaven um, so that they could be sustained even in the worst parts of the desert as they're out there for 40 years. Um, and so that, that, goes, that goes through there. Um, what else do we see? Oh yeah, of course, the most one of the most famous of Jesus' uh, miracles was this walking on water incident um, where they're out in the boat and Jesus is, is asleep and suddenly a storm arises on the the Sea of Galilee and they're getting tossed and fro here and uh, here and there kind of thing and finally they wake up Jesus who's who's apparently napping this whole time um, by the way and they say Lord we're gonna die uh, you know uh, sort of thing and 
Jesus ends up coming to them. Oh, sorry, this, that's a different uh, different version of the story, but uh, this one, uh, Jesus is basically walking on the water and they are freaking out because nobody walks on water. Um, and he says, don't worry, uh, have courage, uh, don't be afraid and uh, commands Peter at his request to come and walk on the water. And the the key to this particular story or the the point of the story is that G, uh, that Peter is able to walk on water so long as he keeps his eyes on Jesus. But as soon as he turns from the good path, turns from from what you know who's in front of him and what he believes in and looks at the bad stuff in the in in life the the crashing of waves the 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 uh the lightning and the storm and the, the thunder and all that stuff that's when he sinks it's only when you're actually your eyes are on the prize kind of thing you're walking towards jesus that you have that ability to persevere um and so that's a that's a good story that's a good principle period um in life but in in actuality um it's how we can do miraculous things um, as well. So let me see here. Um, so also one of the things that Jesus does and kind of ends up getting him in trouble in the end, which we'll get to again, is that Jesus loves to go against the religious people who are high and mighty, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the teachers of the law and the uh, the, the priesthood or the, the, the politicians of the day, essentially. And basically say you guys are being idiots like you guys are you guys have this tradition that you keep doing that is actually going against what is fundamentally correct based in the actual law and so you're being a bunch of hypocrites and he loves to say that to these really powerful people because he likes to keep power in check and like power in check he likes to to shine a spotlight on injustice particularly in the hands of those who have all the power, right? Which is why he had such a big movement in the first place, for the record. Like, a lot of Jesus' teachings, a lot of people will, will kind of suggest he's something of a rebel because he's always speaking against power, very often than not. Um, and so, yeah, this is, so that's kind of what we get through. Um, some of these, these strange traditions that the Pharisees and Sadducees have and sort of speaking up against them, um, clarifying some Old Testament type of things, recognizing people's faith, um, and, and, ex and sort of, um, yeah, rec just recognizing that this is, this is the type of faith that people ought to have. Um, and he does that quite a few times. He does that for some of the lowest of citizens. So women weren't particularly treated as as equal citizens um obviously for a long time but even in the bible this is this is just the culture that they lived in and he says this of the lowest of low in terms of culture in this area she's got it right when it comes to faith and then he goes to people who are not even in the kingdom in terms of the family of the the jewish history of the the jewish nation to romans who are oppressors to his people and there's a Roman soldier who comes by and says, I have a sick servant and I care about this guy. Can you please heal him? And But I'm also a guy in command. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a soldier. I'm, a, I'm in authority of other men. So I recognize your authority, Jesus. So just say the word and I recognize that my servant will be healed. And Jesus is like, I haven't found anybody in my own country amongst my own countrymen who has faith like this guy. And ends up, and he says, go by your by your faith it's been done sort of thing so he recognizes the value of people's faith even on the lowest rung or the furthest um the furthest culturally divisive or or what would you say uh sort of the anti-cultural people basically he says they're still valid because they have faith and it's basically the point the point is like no matter who you are it's your faith in jesus that that is bringing out the miracles that are happening here. And so at one point he even goes back to his hometown where everybody kind of knew him as a kid. And he says, no prophet from his own town has ever done anything miraculous because they always picture you, or that, that prophet, like the little boy who never did a miracle in his life, who's just a carpenter or, you know, worked with stone. You know, that's why they call him a stonemason or a carpenter. Um, 
And so he didn't do many miracles back in his hometown in, in Bethlehem. So, um, yeah, it goes through there. Coco has a question. Absolutely, Coco. What question would you have? Um, I'll just quickly, you know, if you, yeah, if you do have anything, you know, you, you want to clarify or anything, guys, please definitely uh, jump in as well. So anyone can pitch, but how would you define being humble? Pitch in. Okay. Son of God needs nappies too. Son of God needs nappies too. I love it. Or rewording it. What does it mean to be humble, to have humility? Um, the, the best way that I've, I don't know, do you guys, do you guys have an idea? of what humble means or what it means to be humble or to, to have humility? Um, well, I can look up the exact definition, but just off the top of my head, yeah, being humble is like knowing that you can do something, but like not bragging about it or, mm. or rubbing it in someone's face. Mm -hmm. yeah, fair enough. So the actual dictionary is having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's own importance mm -hmm. or of low social administrative or political rank or lower someone in dignity or importance. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's true in, in that case. So it's, it's showing a modest or low estimate of one's own importance. So you think of yourself as not as important or, or just less than but I, I feel like being humble can also mean that like sort of what I said earlier just mm -hmm. that you you can be good or, or just be important but when you're humble about it you don't like again rub it in someone's face or say mm -hmm. I'm high and mighty and it's like the opposite of that essentially the opposite of being high and mighty and like ooh all you ants have like look up to me blah 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 <laughs> yeah i think that's i think that's a fair a fair way to say it um i don't necessarily the the definition in the in that you've given is a little bit misleading and and here's here's the distinction uh, i'll give two things the first thing is that to be humble is the opposite to be prideful right and so one of the most common sayings in in scripture in particular but even just we get we obviously get it from scripture but but people say it all the time that pride goeth before the fall, right? And so the question about what pride is helps us to, to further define what humility is. And so pride is thinking about oneself very highly, whether you have the merit to do so or not, right? So, so people say, be proud of yourself. Be proud of yourself for what? Just cause? Because I am amazing because I say so? Like what? What do you have that is evidenced to to propel that that high view of yourself, right? And and so to me, that's that's the negative thing because if you here's a practical example of pride in my in my view to to bring out to to not bring any sort of political or you know politically correct ideas on it, it's sort of like saying I'm the best piano player. Ever. I'm so amazing. I love how much I'm great at the piano. And then you're called upon to play the piano recital and you don't have anything practically skill wise, creative creativity wise or anything in your own ability as a musician, as a true musician to play a recital where people will be like, that was good, objectively great art. In fact, you suck and therefore you fall. <laughs> Because you put yourself on such a high pedestal, you you've bigged yourself up to such a degree that, you know that that it it belies even belief. You know it belies the truth, right? Um, they got humbled. Exactly, exactly right. So, um, so that to me is so yeah, humility. Yeah, that makes much more sense. <laughs> right. So to be humble and to to so so in that act to be humbled is to show the truth. Fundamentally, humility and pride deal with deal in the truth, right? And so, um, the best example or the best definition of humility that I've ever heard is to not to think of your to not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. So I'll say that again: not to think less of yourself. In other words, not to beat yourself down, to whip yourself, and say, "Oh, I'm just a human. I'm just crappy. I'm shit." Yada 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 
That's not what humility is, which is kind of the definition that you gave sort of implies, right? Yeah. But it's more of, it's not about me. It's about the truth. It's about what is accurate, what is real. And so if I'm mm. actually a good piano player, then I say, yeah, I have I have a great skill in, in being a piano player. And so when I'm called upon to play a piano rec recital, then I can play it. I'm good, you know, and it's not it's not bragging if it's true. Right. And so that to me is the delineation. Um, I like to think of pride as rationalizing other people as having less worth using a precursor to mistreating them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's this is why, look, this is why the definitions of things are important too. Like I, I take a bit of issue with, with people elevating pride as a virtue, you know? Whether that's in like, you know, pride days or pride, you know, it's, it's because my understanding, my under, my understanding of the actual definition of pride throughout time, except for maybe the last 50 years, depending on how people perceive what that means, um, that pride has always been a bad thing. It's been a negative mm. human quality. And so well, to, up, you know, <laughs> it's one of the seven deadly sins after all. <laughs> right, right. So, so it's kind of like, look, I mean, unless what you mean, and this is why, I, this is why I think say what you mean and mean what you say is really important to me, right? It's like, what do you mean by pride? You know, if you mean like a certain level of appreciation for, mm -hmm. which is kind of the way it comes out with pride days right. in my view, it's an appreciation for the qualities that you have, the um, the achievements that you've, you've attained, you know, maybe I could get behind it, but that's really not, I would say 90% of the time, if not more, the way people are saying it. Cause, cause it still has, it still has to be, it, it the truth has to be at the core of what pride, uh, what the definition of pride is in my mind. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you are prideful to have achieved something that you haven't done anything for, so I'm proud to be straight. Let's let's just call let's go on the sexuality side for just a second. Mm -hmm. For me to be pride prideful about being straight makes no sense because I didn't do anything to be straight or bi or gay or like I didn't achieve anything that to do that. That's just the way I am. So why would I be prideful of something that I did nothing to achieve? It's like I'm proud to be poor, I'm proud to be rich. It's like it's it's not it's not the the trait or the quality or the virtue one ought to be elevating in my mind. So, um, <laughs> partly ignoring my button aimbot. I always forget that I have this thing on. <laughs> Modest and humble opinion of oneself. Avoid pride and arrogance. Yeah, you know, the, the aimbot's not too bad, actually. A, uh, aimbot, AI bot. Uh, forests and otters. Always good to have a game plan when explaining the wilderness. Yeah. I don't know what he means by that. So in what case is it okay to have pride? Again, I it depends on your definition of pride. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like there should be two separate words. There's like a good pride and a bad pride, I guess. Which is um, kind of why I don't like English, you know? It's <laughs> look, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna harp on this again, but in English <laughs> there's one word for love. But clearly, when when a, a father says "I love you" to their child, it is completely different in meaning than "I love you" to his spouse or "I love you" to his brother, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And in the same way, pride is at least historically, in my opinion, a terrible word to use to to, to elevate. I would say, um, I would say. Pride is almost the pride is almost similar to worship. You know, people worship at the altar of what? Right? They they adore, they they are in awe of what? The mall or the divine or nature, you know? It's it's what say, you know, that that I worship at all is a question of the object to that. So that's just another example, right? So in pride of what it's like you're already bringing the 
the word that you're using in my view is already have like a, a pretty negative connotation to i would say histor historos in, in historosity right so <laughs> so in what case is it okay to have pride I would say it is always good to be humble if what you mean by humble is being accurate and truthful and not thinking always about yourself, but what you can bring to others, you know? So if like, again, we go back to the, the piano, right? If what you can bring to others is a song and beauty, then that's good. You're not necessarily the focus there. It's what you're bringing to others. It's, you know, you're thinking of yourself less not less of yourself, right? You don't detract from yourself. That's silly. You know, you, you're, you're obviously the music player, but yeah. Um, in what I feel like in this case, say gay pride, it's more claiming ownership of their sexuality in opposition to cultural oppression and silencing. And that's I fair. That. I think, I think that that's a fair perspective on it, right? Like to, to, own what has been denounced um justly or unjustly right yep that's probably closer to where it lands I'd yeah say. i i get i get the spirit or the intention behind a lot of people who who have pride for those you know their 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 qualities whatever those qualities are you know like you know, quality you know skinny pride fat pride you know like all these different it's just it to me it doesn't it doesn't bring in the aspect of it that there's there's nothing there that's that you've worked for that you've that you've you've attained that you've achieved right it's it's a it's almost like you're you're bragging about something that isn't even really like bragging worth, worthy kind of thing right like like if somebody said Look, even if so, if somebody's pride, prideful enough of saying like I'm the I'm a rocket scientist, you know, and I've sent rockets successfully to space and brought them back and landed them again, then I'm not saying it's good to have pride, but at least it's something that you could have pride in because you've achieved something, you know. That makes sense. And and it's like, but like <laughs> being prideful of I don't know I'm proud of blue skies. It's just as silly to me. Right? It's like, did you do anything to make the sky blue? You know, would even even if God bragged about making blue sp skies, which I don't think he's ever done, you know, it's like, oh, I I picked out that shade on the wall kind of thing. It's like, at least he actually did something about it, and he has the right to be prideful. But it's like, it's like, you know, does that make uh, sense? I don't know. Yeah, I, I've been to uh, like a pride parade mm -hmm. in June before, and I guess what people are prideful for mm -hmm. when it comes to something that they're like going against like for like the uh oppression and and right. such like that is uh I, i've even seen some just like some nudists out mm. there in the pride parade just mm -hmm. walking around they're they're being proud because they're because they can do that and right that's what they want to do i guess but I, I get where you're you're coming from where pride can stem a lot more meaning into uh when it comes from something that you've achieved or like yeah even just if it's a piece of art too it's like i've done some art and there's a lot of people that just can't bring themselves to do art so i'm proud proudful of my ability to do that and i think i mean i think that's great that's actually a really good point like let's let's take it to like once upon a time people who were you know who were african or had black skin and everything like that weren't allowed to sit on certain parts of the bus right mm -hmm. and right. so there is a way in which once that became legal even though it should never have been illegal obviously you know <laughs> there's a time and point where they, that individual who could like let's say rosa parks right did rosa parks sit on the bus in against you know this really crazy law that she you know in a place that we, she wasn't allowed to sit because she was being prideful or because she was you know being humble i or in which way did she do it right was she trying to mm -hmm. you know and and so like there's a way in which you can conduct yourself and and what would you say and 
there's a way in which you can... I don't want to say achieve. It's not an it's not an achievement. It's you can put forth that which you the qualities that you have, right? There's a way in which you can do so in a prideful, uh, uh, offensive, or at least you know flaunting way. And there's a way in which you can do it in that is like this is this is who I am, and I accept that and whether or not people accept it like this is this is the truth right and that's what i think is part of my issue with some of those parades is like it's not really it's it's yeah may, maybe it is maybe you know like i said there it's it's hard to say you can't wipe you can't just wash it with one paintbrush right yep. and that's like exactly. there are certainly individuals that are that are behind the pride parades and the you know whatever whatever is going on whatever is whatever they need to engage with in society that they're engaging with that they are doing so because they are trying to exemplify or express the truth that they understand 100 percent fair enough like if that's what you're doing and that's the heart behind it then of course that's a heart of humility that's a that's a heart of you know authenticity mm -hmm. then there's also those who are clearly doing it to get attention to say look at me and i'm going to I, we're the conquerors and we're awesome and we're going to make this you know this whole show just about me me i i i you know and that's mm -hmm. the pride side of things that is clearly not helpful it's not helpful to the the people who are witnessing it because they they don't get they don't get uh, anything positive out of it but the people who are look, getting all the attention that attention very often times is negative you know so it's it's not it's not in humility you know so i don't know maybe that's uh, that's my take on it i guess sounds like a valid take i'd say but yeah uh, that, that's why i think it's uh it's interesting to think that i mean there there are different ways of looking at things and uh i mean it's different person to person mm -hmm. it's it's not always just black and white that's <laughs> but that's thing. exactly it that's why i don't like talking about or not talking about that's why i don't want to look at an entire movement or group of people as a group mm -hmm. of people or a movement you have to look at the individuals and what what's going on there yeah that's it. Hmm. it's a good I'm question tough. Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, all all that to be said, humility tends to look, you're not the focal point. What you can do and what you what the truth is, you know, and and in a way in engaging with things, it has to yeah. It has to do a lot less with look at me, look at me kind of thing. But it it certainly doesn't detract from yourself and say cuz a lot of people do think um that humility is like beating yourself down and saying, oh, I'm I'm a piece of shit and, you know, I don't I don't deserve anything, you know, which even if that's true to some degree, you know, at least from a Christian perspective, you know, like a humble thing to say is that whilst I do things that are bad, you know, that are sinful, that are wrong, I'm I'm clearly worthy of the life I have and the love that I that I can give and that I can get because I'm created in such a way that all other things in creation have been sacrificed before. You know, that, that God loves human beings so much intrinsically, regardless of what they've done, good or bad, you know, by the fact that they, you know, that they, that, that, Christ has died for them on this on the cross you know it's an authentication that you are worthy right and right if people understood that, that yeah if people understood their base value to the highest good that has ever existed then I don't think that we need the attention or the the crazy you know whatever it, whatever it is you know like whether that's uh, the attention of your spouse, the attention of your parents, or anything like that. I'm not saying that those aren't good things and that you shouldn't hope for those things, but 
they don't actually explain or express the value that you even have because those things, those people, whether, you know, even yourself are limited, but God's love is eternal by definition, being himself and eternal, right? And so mm -hmm. that's why it's such a powerful mm -hmm. message in the first place. It's that which is eternal thinks of you so highly that he would sacrifice his most high possession to be in relationship. Like, that's a crazy thing to suggest, you know, and and for it to be true. <laughs> so, but mm. anyway, that's uh, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a bit. But <laughs> so that was that's <laughs> the end of the story. <laughs> we're, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, OK, well, that was definitely a. Uh, good talk. <laughs> yeah, it was a good. It was a good topic. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Nice dialogue. I appreciate that, Coco. Hi, I'm Zell, Vizella Zell. Be super awesome if you wanted to do the whole liking thing, and maybe even do the whole <laughs> subscribe. Or perhaps you're you're like me and you just talk too much and you just you're weird and you want all your weirdness to be out there. In that case, you can comment down below, and if you know, and you don't. It'll... I won't care. And that kind of gets us basically to where we are here in Matthew 17, which is where things take a huge turn when it comes to uh, uh, what's been going on or what goes on. So um, if you if one of you want to read, you're certainly welcome to. Do you care to read it all, Adam? Or... Uh, I'm OK for now. <laughs> so Okie dokie. <clears throat> Matthew 17, the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transformed in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. Even his clothes became white as the light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them, uh, him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I will make three tabernacles here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elisha. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell face down and were terrified. Then Jesus came up touched them and said get up don't be afraid when they took uh, when they looked up they saw no one except him jesus alone as they were coming down from the mountain jesus commanded them don't tell anyone about the vision until the son of man is raised from the dead wow he he knew he just he knew <laughs> so the disciples questioned him why then do they do the scribes say that elijah must come first Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they didn't recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. There's a couple of interesting things about the transfiguration. It's the most, it's one of the more, you know, famous play, famous things that happens, basically. And it picks, like actually God coming in a cloud and speaking in thunderous. Right, debate. right. So, <laughs> so essentially what this is kind of hearkening back to, and it's interesting that Moses himself is, is one of the mm -hmm. guys that, that is there. Um, so Moses is the one who, the, the the Moses and Elijah figures are really important. Um, they're they're sort of types or meta types of what, and they represent something bigger than themselves. Moses represents the law, and so he's famously known to have the the Ten Commandments, and he has the tablets and and everything like that. And so he goes up to a mountain, and you know basically 
communes with God and comes down with the Ten Commandments. And Elijah is one of the prophets who is able to sort of foretell or foresee during um, a great sort of calamity for the people of Israel, um, what God's will might be. So the idea of the prophet and the lawgiver um, as offices of, uh, of human beings, essentially, or hu human offices kind of thing. And so the idea that Moses and Elijah both are, are sort of present there, um, whether they came from heaven or whether they're ghosts or I mean, that's that's kind of up to debate. I I think it's sort of a it show it's it's one of these instances that suggests that there is an eternality to the to a human being that God persists on giving life, whether that's on this plane of existence or like in heaven or whatever that means in hell, whatever, like whatever those things mean, right? There's some level of eternality to human beings and that they um, they come in their metatypes or as an office and authenticate Jesus once more, saying this is the man who has the whole law and has all the prophets as one um, supporting him or that he's, you know, he at the very least is equal to them kind of thing in, in those offices. Um, and then one of the things that is very common and the reason why they kind of freak out about it is because in scripture in the Old Testament, you can't actually see the fullness of God. To, to do so, the, the idea is like, it would be so much, it would be so powerful it would be so overwhelming that human beings just couldn't withstand it. So the famous mm -hmm. one is like, I'll pass by you and I'll let you see the back of my head, quote unquote, which is obviously mean. It just means it's sort of like a, it's a physical ex ex expression of something that is non-physical, right? It's like, what, how else am I supposed to explain eternity? Right. You know, you know it's like looking, it's kind of like looking at a, at the, what would you say? Um, you ever watch, um, I'm thinking of uh, Doctor Strange. You know how Doctor Strange goes into like multiple dimen multiple dimensions when he gets pushed out of his body and he kind of gets just yeah. jacked. Uh -oh. um, but yeah, so to me, it's sort of like trying to explain to Doctor Strange before he actually experienced, you know, the level of going through all these different dimensions and everything like that. You know, trying to explain to him like, yeah, I don't. You you really can't experience just me as myself. And so what mm -hmm. happens at the end of that experience, like Dr. Strange gets sat down in a, in a seat, seat and he's like pouring sweat, he's shaking, he's freaking out. And that's that's like the, just that's an actual lived experience that he had, but it's nowhere near what actual actually God is, right? So. Uh, you know, when, when you talk about that, I, I remember a dogma movie that the voice of God Explodes right. your heart kind of thing. <laughs> right, exactly. So so anyway, so people were greatly afeared to actually even hear God's voice or see his face because we're gonna die if we actually look at this guy. You know, like that's mm -hmm. how overwhelmingly powerful. So that's that obviously they're you know, the, the fact that they're terrified is they, they think they're gonna die kind of thing. So what else was I gonna say about this passage? Elijah's coming most. So yeah, basically, um, one of the one of the prophecies, one of the things that people are waiting for for the Messiah is this understanding that Elijah was supposed to come and authenticate the Messiah, which which he did. It's just people didn't realize thought that it would be Elijah himself, and he's saying, well, actually, John the Baptist was just like Elijah, and they just refused to recognize his authority and his position as a prophet, which was John the Baptist, of course. But if you really needed to be authenticated, here's the actual Elijah doing that with Moses kind of thing. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Hmm. All right, if you wanted to continue. Sure. The power of faith over a demon. When they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt down before him. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. 
Jesus replied, You unbelieving and rebellious generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and from that moment the boy was healed. When the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? Because of your little faith, he told them. For I assured you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. Hmm. This one always confused me. I... Well, it... Because he's just, he's just said that, you know, that if you have enough faith, you can rebuke and you can cast out demons, you know? And so... I don't know what it means to quantify a level of faith, you know, to 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 have a like because it, it makes it seem that faith is like a substance that you can have enough of, you know, like liquid. And if you have if you can pour out enough of it, then you can wash away the demons, you can wash away the evil, that kind of thing. And I just, I don't know about this one. This is the one that, that I've never, uh, I've never fully understood. Because of your little faith. That's right. There you go. Uh, All right. If you want to continue. <laughs> the second prediction of his death. As they were meeting in Galilee, Jesus told them, the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised up. And they were deeply distressed. Uh, continue? Mm, yeah, my short one. Paying the temple tax. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the double drachma tax approached Peter and said, Doesn't your teacher pay the double drachma tax? Yeah, that sounds like <laughs> something so made up. <laughs> yeah. The double tax. Yeah, he said. Uh, yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? Who do earthly kings collect tariffs and taxes from? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, he said. Then the sons are free, Jesus told them. Be but so we won't offend them, go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you will find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. <laughs> So there's apparently like actual historical records of fish having like coins in their bellies or something like that. So, mm. uh, so this might actually be pointing towards something like that uh, that that has happened happened in the past. But basically, so what he's basically saying here is, look, if you're the king of the kingdom, right, and you know you're you're trying to take a tax from people, who do you who do you take a tax from? It's like normally the king taxes. The, the people, right? He doesn't tax the prince. And that's kind of what he's suggesting here is it's like, isn't it a little weird that we're getting taxed, even though like um, you know, we're the princes, you know, we we're we're sons of the of the kingdom kind of thing. And yet, this is this is the interesting part. This is where my I think the the basis of my Canadian sensibilities that I've held on to comes from <laughs> because but there's so a desire defend them. <laughs> there's a desire in me to be an absolute monster a hole because I think people are just dumb all the time. Like I <laughs> I admit my faults. I am I am genuinely prideful and genuinely arrogant about certain things and think oh that guy's an idiot. It's, it's kind of like people who people do it all the time, right? Talk about, you know, political figures or, or whatever. And they just have that inner dialogue and they just shake their head. They're, they're shaking their he head is the outward expression of their inner monologue saying, these guys are absolutely moronic. <laughs> Coco, yeah, Coco raises his hand. <laughs> um, but the 
principle, or at least the desire to not offend, kind of comes from this. Because that's what I used to be all the time. I was always that. I think Canadians in general are I'm like still that. that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lunar. But like to me, almost every Canadian is nice, but they probably have some backward talk in their in their their heads um, for sure that are like truly negative yeah some people can't like uh, i've seen some canadians that are not so nice sure um but yeah I, I do agree that the the not wanting to offend is is still there it's like we do think about our our uh, community appearance in in ways but yeah i don't know this is almost to me the principle of putting a mask on even if you've gotten your shots for covid you know it's like <laughs> i don't want to offend people i guess so i'll wear it even if i don't agree with it you know like yeah. i think there is something there is a there is a pro social and appropriate way in which you can interact with people whom you totally disagree with or that you even think that that's wrong, that there is a level of of behavior that you should still do to try not to offend. That's not to say that you go wildly against your, your beliefs and what you think and what you understand is correct. I certainly would speak up. And w here's, here's the thing for me. If somebody asks me a direct question about something, then in an appropriate sphere, obviously we're trying not to get too left of you know left of uh uh left of uh, what we're what we're talking about sort of thing but but to me it's like i i really do want to go out of my way to at least make people feel comfortable and not to offend them and that sort of thing so um yeah for some reason i, I take this as like jesus basically saying this tax thing is nonsense but so we won't offend people here, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll do a miracle to get it done, sort of thing. The Geneva Convention was largely largely in, in response to Canadian soldiers. I actually did not know that. Fascinating. Interesting. That's not a hearts thing, Coco. <laughs> yeah, I, I like this uh, twenty-seven. Uh, I see two things. It's the but so we won't offend them. It's like doesn't matter how dumb it is, we'll still kind of respect them as people kind of thing um and then the second part where it's like those in need will be provided sort of thing it's like well just go do this and it's gonna happen take it and give it to them mm -hmm, for me mm -hmm. coco has an important question yeah i didn't i actually didn't know that uh, jade I, I genuinely didn't Coco has an important question that Coco needs an answer to. Sure, no problem. Adam's being quiet as usual. You're welcome to pitch in or say anything you want to, Adam. Oh just, yeah, no, I'm just, just enjoying listening to y'all. Yep. <laughs> all right, just making sure. Just making sure. I want to. Yep. I want to yep. invite as much as I can. That's all. <laughs> yeah, no, you're fine. I'm just enjoying listening to you both talk and learning. Never, never <laughs> don't know any of this stuff. So I'm just listening in. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Cool. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I just always want to. I want to be as inclusive as I can be. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Especially since it's my program and I can do whatever I want. And I think Adam's awesome. So. <laughs> yep. And you'll know that I'll 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 punch in and talk if I. <laughs> That's right. That's right. If fair I, enough. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> How does it feel to be a goat? How <laughs> does one become the goat? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny very important question uh the goat is uh you know look i had a goated uh teacher and goated uh, father and uh, mother and uh, sibling and and friends so uh, i am only the culmination of other goatedness so uh thank you <laughs> <laughs> all right shall we hit uh matthew 18 I'll link you later off stream so I don't distract me. Yeah, that sounds no, literally, uh give me a give me a link, man. That sounds awesome. I'd definitely be interested in learning about that. Alright, Matthew 18. Who is the goated? 
<laughs> so perfectly timed. Yes. <laughs> you can't make this up. <laughs> Who is the true goat? There you go. Oh, God, that's perfect. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, who is the greatest of all time? Yes, indeed. At that oh. time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then he called a child to him and had him stand among them. I assure you, he said, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. But whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him in a, in a, if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or your foot causes your downfall, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes your downfall, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than, rather than have two eyes and be thrown into hellfire. This was similar to what we read mm -hmm. earlier in Matthew, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's basically similar to the Sermon on the Mount. What he, what he said. Right. So, two things. Here's here's to me the most one of the most important things that's ever said in Scripture. And it's, it's because oftentimes it comes up that children were treated very poorly uh, in, in the, you know, in history. <clears throat> very oftentimes they were sort of third class citizens. They, you know, they didn't have any value. This is what Jesus says about kids. And this is the way I think actual people who have any ounce of goodness in their heart recognize children. He says, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He said, unless you are like children, so there are qualities in children that make human beings great. And this is the important part that every human being, regardless of age, still possesses. The fundamental nature of what makes greatness is the humility, the openness, the joy, the capacity, the potential of a child. And that's of great value in God's kingdom. That children are the are, are great, you know, and that they really don't like look. If there's one thing that got me sent to prison <laughs> is is the idea that people hurt children. It it made me so angry, especially in a in a you know in a physical, you know, sexual contents and stuff like that. So to me, this is a, a direct polemic against any person in the church, out of the church, anywhere that that has ever harmed a kid. This is Jesus himself saying the greatest in the kingdom are like children. And so to me, people who don't treat children like the greatest, like the most treasured possession that we have on this planet, uh, there's just a level of me that can, I don't know. Part of my soul wants to shrivel up, uh, so that I so it's, and then vacate my body, so that my actual desire to just crush people who hurt kids just allows just goes crazy. I swear. So yeah, uh, mm -hmm. it just it just it does drive me. So uh, oh yeah, I mean yeah. it sh it definitely should in that way of like children are sacred and children are mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. innocent and they shall not be anyway influenced or abused um mm -hmm. they should just be left <laughs> to grow and learn and if you want to fuck with somebody yeah. else do it in your own i should say your own age range or somebody that's going to hit you back right. or somebody that's going to right. you know not not saying to do it to another person yeah. is but 
but the fact of the innocence that because you can get away with it um so that's just, yeah it's you know, it's like the lowest of the low to yes yeah, yeah. and, to I, and I, I i feel like i was a person who was in that position mm. who had opportunity to hurt them or mm. you know i would mm -hmm. I, I would i would have that anger that that natural anger that we have inside of us as human beings um yeah. of hurting children is it should that should stay that way of um that should stay that emotions to stay there with mm -hmm, our children mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so to get and so learner do you have anything else you want to say i just i don't want to like pass by that and, no <laughs> I, that, that was perfectly fine actually I, I like what you had to say about that um the only other thing is that it makes sense that they uh depict like little angels as like babies and kids mm. and children such like cherubim that. yeah yeah exactly I, I don't want to go past what he says here too because it, it's an it's actually yes, important yeah because I don't want to because there's <clears> another <throat> part here that's that's important so I assure you unless you are converted and become like children like that's a pretty like converted is a very pregnant word is the way I say it right it's 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 got a lot of meaning behind it so what does that mean to be converted and become like children mm. my understanding of what he means here is this idea of people being already full already rooted in a way of in which they believe themselves believe the way the world works understands you know who they are and everything like that and the suggestion he's making here is to become like children who are innocent who are open who are are who 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 have something full of potential right to not be closed off to not reject to not be like this what he says earlier like this adulterous generation who have mm -hmm. ears but don't hear and who have eyes but don't see that they they have this lens over top of them like let's let's call it like a red or a blue lens or something like that so that when they see the entire world it's just blue or it's just red and he's saying yep. no no children don't have that they must be innocent babes. They must be back to the start. They must be open to what the world is actually expressing. And usually people wear those lenses. They put on those earmuffs, whatever you want to call, usually because they have been traumatized in some way. They're trying to control life in some way. You know, they're trying to protect themselves. And so it's not necessarily always a bad thing that we are the way we are and that we've cho chosen to interact with and engage with the world how we have. It, there, there are reasons for it. And so it's it's not like that it's diabolically evil that we keep doing that. But what, what Jesus is saying here is, if you really want to understand the totality of this story, the things that you experienced as a, ch as a child that made you decide to put on these lenses or to see the world in such a way or to ignore certain things, mm -hmm. it's time to cast that off and really look soberly to be like a child and be open to it. And I think that's that to me is the idea of being converted, you know, not to not like conversion kind of suggests it's it's got a bad rap i think it's got a bad you know, I, I agree yeah uh, understanding of it so i, I think all it's about that english language <laughs> I, I almost want to say i almost want to <clears throat> put my own definition here and and my own word which is very not a great idea for in, in most cases but it's more like being reverted to a state in which you are yes at I core agree. what you, you know that that child that you actually are and to and that's yep. And that's where that's a, probably to go back to our conversation about humility. Like, there's nothing more humble than a baby, you know, right. that the, what's mm -hmm. so what's humble about a child, what's humble about a baby isn't that they aren't awesome, that they are pieces of crap that literally crap all over the place and stuff. That's not what makes them great. What makes them great is that they are, by definition, miraculous. They exist. They've been built. They've been meticulously designed to go from humble beginnings to to something even beyond that which is just extra but they're always going to be great by definition you know they have that value they have that 
it, it, it's just it's look i i don't i'm not even a dad <laughs> if i if i were a dad i would be i guarantee you i'd feel it even more you know but yeah. like like look i've seen my 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 one of my best friends you know uh ian scam man he's a you know he just had his second kid and i've seen those baby pictures i don't have kids i recognize the value i recognize their greatness it does nothing it just eats mm -hmm. and sleeps and poops <laughs> but it's still amazing <laughs> you know so yep. anyway <laughs> uh, we, we lose our imagination and our, yeah. our openness like you said when we grow up and uh uh, it's, it's also another reason why I feel like children are more susceptible to mm. um, extra planar forces, if, if you say, like mm. ghosts and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You usually hear about that a little more because yeah. uh, for that similar reason, they're just so much more open. Their minds aren't yeah. realified. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you even look at the, the biology, like the actual construction of a child, like uh, like their bones, for example even their bones are malleable they're they're yeah. able to actually take a hit and not crack their skulls because they're still their skulls haven't hardened yet their eat their bones aren't hard yet they can bounce back because yeah. they have that potential and so so in my mind two things the first thing is to go just to go back to it the greatness of the child that you are makes you the greatest in the kingdom of heaven period without anything extra it's that belief it's that openness it's that capacity already intrinsically placed into you anything more that you can go through in life is just extra right that's you that's me that's everybody and it's important to get the glasses off whether those glasses are telling you you're the most amazing person in the world because you whatever whatever you are or because you're the crappiest person in the world because you went to jail, you, you know, you ruined your, your fiance, like whatever the list of things that I could personally list that makes me terrible in my eyes. If I were to cast those glasses off and recognize the child within, that's the greatest. That's worthy of life. That's worthy of being here. And that's an important message that you really need to tell yourself at the very least in the mirror cast whatever whatever makes you think that you're you beyond the base beyond the core beyond the child that you are because that's enough that's worthy that's okay and then the other part of it is when we get back to that then everything is possible that just like a child being open being ready to adapt to experience whatever it is good and bad that's not to say that there isn't going to be terrible crap that's good your own crap you know that's going to come up but if you can approach it from being like that child then that's when you're actually you have the potential of growing regardless of the good or the bad you know whether there are thorns in your life or whether there's plenty of rain and sunshine you know you'll still grow you'll still be able to get through it so there's my preach for today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. But then I, I do like the, the second part of this, you know, if you screw with my kid, you know, is basically the way it comes off. Woe to the world because of the, the offenses coming by somebody, you know, onto one of these children. Like, seriously, like deal with your jazz whatever that is you know it is better to like genuine like look it's it's obviously he's not like this is called hyperbole there's an actual term for it it is an exaggeration of doing something so he's saying cut off your foot cut off your hand cut off your eye whatever it is that is causing you to to cause an offense get rid of it and it's not because that thing in and of itself will condemn you. That's not the point of it. The point of it is that you are still that child that is worthy and you're harming the child that is intrinsically good. So whatever is actually causing you as a child or another child that God has created in this world, whatever causing that offense, like true, you know, harm, get rid of it in your life. That's what, that's the point is take it seriously because I love that kid. That's the greatest in the kingdom. The greatest, you can't go higher. So why are you hurting that? Whether that's you or another person. That's the point, you know? 
So that's why he's using this hyperbolic language, because he's serious about how great a child is, how great it is to harm, you know, yeah. one of these children. So much as saying being thrown into the eternal fire when you do it. <laughs> right. You know, whether that's a literal again, to me, this is this is my my personal view on on hell and everything like that is that it's it tends to be hyperbolic. You know, that there's a physical place because we take we tend to need physical visual things to to represent something terrible, right? Like just that's just how humans work. What hell actually is, if it's a state of mind, if it's a state of existence that is extra dimensional, I don't I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. I, I wrestle with it. I've I've wrestled a lot with that particular those passages in scripture. What I do know is that it's something that people can really feel when they even hear the word hellfire. True true consequence for our our negative actions we we know intrinsically i think you know in our minds that we are deserving of some kind of balancing to the things that we've done you know i don't know and so using that word hellfire hell whatever is representative of what we know we deserve for the wrongs we've done but to to keep us in there for a second whether we deserve it or not, that's the whole principle of grace. What the whole principle of what Jesus came to do is to cover that up, to take on whatever we owe and put it upon himself. So anyway, we, we, again, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> mm -hmm. You think you're all that in a bag of potato chips, do you? You think the Zelazel ain't worth your time and your effort to watch, to contemplate, to engage with? So you don't want to like, and you don't want to subscribe. Perhaps you don't want to comment down below. Well, if that's the case, I don't know what to tell you, Joe, except... <laughs> okay. Ooh, this is a good one. Another parable, yay. Mm hmm This one is of the lost sheep. See that you don't look down on one of these little ones, because I tell you that in heaven, their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save the lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the ninety-nine on the hillside and go and search for the stray? And if he finds it, I assured you, he rejoices over that sheep more than over the more than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. I think it's interesting because he's <clears throat> I think it was very intentional for anybody who knows what sheep are like. And if you go and watch some of the videos of sheep, what they are is fundamentally dumb. <laughs> they get themselves into really silly places. They get lost all the time. They get stuck in little cracks and stuff. And you, you can pull them out and then the next second they'll fall into a crack again of in the ground or something like that. And it's I think it's important to recognize, and he's not saying it in a in a detrimental way, but he's saying it as a as an as one who would observe. He goes from saying that children are the greatest thing to then saying that these little ones, these lost ones, are like sheep. They children are dumb, like they don't know. But that's not a negative thing. It's they don't know what the world's like, and they just are going through life, kind of eyes wide and just experiencing it all, positive and negative, right? And so he goes from that recognition of the greatness of a child, but also to the value of that child by saying, look, even a sheep, which, look, is actually pretty important to a farmer or to, to a, a shepherd, right? It's like, if one of them goes missing, then he's going to leave every other valuable thing because he because he recognizes the value of each individual sheep that goes astray, you know. 
an audio wolf? Do I not have auto? No, you have auto. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. Uh, uh, it's just a clip. Oh, gotcha. Unavoidable. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> but yeah, so so fundamentally though, like, like I, I, a lot of people who who've read this in the past basically are saying, oh, it's the stupid ones, you know, that sort of thing. Is that's the focus? Is like you know, Jesus is being in, intentionally like harsh in this culture. Sheep, like, basically a shepherd was actually one of the lowest jobs you could possibly have, but it's he's recognizing at that low station and the lowest sort of animal that you would you would you know take care of that it's that humbleness it's that lowly position that the value is still shown through you know and that it's really important to to recognize so anyway hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense like that's what he's doing here is trying to connect on that way so this yep, is I see that. this is the lesson that I thought for some reason that Paul and maybe he still does. I thought Paul does this in his letters about restoring a brother or to, to somebody who has an argument with you. And it kind of goes back into what Coco was asking the other day um, about, you know, to, to what degree do we, you know, do we forgive or do we do we, you know, um, do we, how do we go about somebody who is like abusive or anything like that? Like, what do you do? Um, and this is, this is the base teaching that Jesus does. Um, so it's actually really cool. Oh. <clears throat> your brother. <clears throat> if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two more with you. So that by testimony, of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he pays no attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like an unbeliever, uh, unbeliever and a tax collector to you. I assure you, whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Again, I assure you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you. By my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Everybody always looks at that last part in like, that's the, that's the part that is focused on. <clears throat> I think this should be the standard by which every person behaves in society personally is if somebody offends you you know if there's something wrong between the two of you just go and talk to him about it knowing that if the guy or girl or whomever says go flip off your hat kind of thing then you can go to two other people and establish every fact with those witnesses get it just get it out between a, a small group Right. But I would say to build on this a little bit, I would say take it so that that there's people who are moderators that that, you know, aren't going to be really swayed back and forth, but at least know the core of people. Right. And then go to the larger body of people. S some people I, look, I, I see, especially in the States, from, from what I can tell, I'm not a, I'm not a guy in the States, so I can't speak too well, heavily. Maybe Adam can speak more to this, you know. But I see this whole culture of like suing people, you know, for for this, that, and the other thing, almost instantly, kind of thing, mm. right? Mm -hmm. I I feel like it never needs to get to that level if we were to just do this: go to two or three people, bring in, establish the facts before us, and kind of hash it out. And then, if you were to go, if you really needed to go to a court or something like that, in this case, it's the church, right? It's the larger community, you know then yeah then and oh and even after that there shouldn't be bad blood you know let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you well we've already talked about it earlier it's like how do you how do you treat your neighbor how do you treat your enemy right mm. you still treat them with respect you know you mm. still treat them well and that to me is the this is like this could be a prototype i think for for any any relationship that you can possibly think of, this is the way it should work. Yep. Do it face to face, 
if you have to, bring in a couple other people to establish every possible fact, just figure out what the story really is, and only then do you bring it to a larger communal body. And then, worst case scenario, still treat them with respect, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Whether they deserve it or not. <laughs> um, I won't go too much into this, but this is, a, I find these, these passages, two things. One of them is this idea that Peter alone had the authority to bind on in heaven and loose on earth. But already here, he's talking to a larger group of people, right? His disciples. Clearly, it wasn't just Peter who had that authority already. So from the, from the Catholic side of things, I, I disagree theologically with, with that position that only the Pope has that, that ability to bind and loose kind of thing. So yeah. anyway, that's that's my perspective on that one. Um, <clears throat> and then this part, some people will say, if two, uh, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. So presumably, uh, some people have said, and I've said as an atheist back in the day, have said, oh, does that mean if two people pray for the death of, you know, Adam because he, you know, spat in my eye, you know, mm -hmm. that God will mm -hmm. do it? kind of thing clearly that's not what's being said here first of all the idea of praying for it means that you are really deeply not only just thinking about it you know but you're also you are recognizing the character of who god is and what he would do and hopefully he's saying something to you whether you're reading scripture to get a clearer idea of who god is like or you have a intuitive understanding of what goodness is that you wouldn't ever pray for the death of a person right so so to me it it belies that presumption so that that you could just pray for anything well i want i want the sky to be purple you know and my brother over here thinks that would be cool too so obviously the sky will be purple tomorrow that's that's not that's not what's being said here so right just, mm -hmm. just making sure because people have thought that for some reason like christian and non-christian um but i do think that this is neat um where two or three this is this is very often quoted for where two or three are gathered together in my name i am there among them i anyway there could be whole sermons on this one passage that i think is important but it's it really is a recognition <laughs> blood moon on the seventh day <laughs> yeah that's what we, yeah we'll play we'll pray for the blood moon that's right <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I, I think this, at the very least, for those who really are the ones who cry out, you know, or who are together and who are working through something, I, I think it's important to recognize that people aren't as alone as they think they are, you know? They might perceive mm. themselves to be. Amen to that. <laughs> yeah. But you're not, you know? And... That's important. That's an, look. I, if there's anything else that is important to kind of get, like perceptually out of your head and get into your heart and your mind, like anchored, uh, a truth that you can't escape from. And this is look. This isn't meant to like scare or, or put because it was early on in my childhood that this idea that I was always being watched, and and watched in a sense of like an oppressive eyeball that was never going to let me be private and do whatever I wanted and that, that sort of thing. That's the way that I had always kind of perceived God. And I don't think that that's correct in terms of the, the spirit of what is actually viewing you or see or being with you. I, I really think that, that by definition, the Holy Spirit is a friend, you know, that God's spirit, that God himself is present and he's called in this context the father because a father cares defends protects and and you know loves his child and it's that presence it's that ever present that omnipresent um state of affairs that i think if we really believed that if we really practiced that then a lot of the things that are negative in our life would would evaporate you know like the sun like a like a a dew drop in the sun 
you know. So, anyway, you're not it's alone. Beautiful. You're not alone <laughs> is my point. Yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. This is interesting. All right. The parable yeah. of the unforgiven, mm-hmm. unforgiving slave. What was that? Peter. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Adam. So basically, like uh, how you talked about being that you're not alone and the uh, other side of demons and devils and mm. the demons and, and the devil secluding a person to mm. feel like they are alone, mm-hmm. that there is no others that are influence them to think that they are alone and i think that's the biggest um factor when it becomes somebody who thinks that they're alarm alone and that those evil plays into that of like Mm. yeah you are alone i'm the only one here for you and it it, kind of is um uh challenging to you know because somebody is always like oh why why isn't god speaking to me or why can Mm. i physically physically hear him or because it's it seems really weird or seems really odd to me that demons that interact with you in a way of of you of being in your home like you physically can feel them or Mm. that they are in your in your space Mm -hmm. uh, with scratches with with bruises with with still kind of physical things right and it's just really confusing in a way to where we want to physically see god or feel that Mm. god is with us but we're feeling it in a way of a spirituality versus an actual physical way um so i just wanted to make a comment about how the evil plays into that of making you feel like you are alone and that's it could you could get wrapped up into that of feeling like oh is that god or mm. is that you know the confusion of that so i just wanted to comment i don't know, just want to comment about that yeah no 100 percent. there's <clears throat> it's you touch on something interesting right like because there is a coercive power that evil seems to have you know like that's that's really what fear is and the and and what courage actually is too courage is facing something it's not a lack of fear it's it's going through something despite the fear you know that that you still obviously are afraid you know but fear is something and it's it's a force it's a it's a thing or or even hate that that seems to coerce something in you um that that consumes and I think, I think God is very much the opposite of coercion. Like that's, that's the difference between love and, and like, what would you say? Somebody who is a lover and a, a person who is a stalker, right? A stalker tries to possess and coerce, right? To, to capture. And a lover is somebody who woos. Right. And I get the sense that that God's nature is never meant to be oppressive, which is why I don't think he does such crazy miracles that like or like walks walks in front of the sky and says, hey, I'm right here. You know, something like that, like something physically oppressive, because that's what it is. It's that's like it. It's it's not in the nature of love to do that, to rob you of any any free will for you to go seeking and to to listen and to be wooed in a way that is that is slow and that is authentic and deep Mm -hmm. you know but the devil does the opposite he will always you know stalk you and 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 promise you things and and you know like show himself in ways that are coercive you know Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I don't like that's think about. that's that's the way that I kind of distinguish. And so anyway, so I, I guess I point that out because for most of my life, I've been that guy who has said, you know, show yourself, just show me anything, show me, show me, show me, show something, anything. I need some physical proof, right? Yeah. Some some something tangible 
for me to even take a, a walk. And, and I've gotten answers to, to some degree, as small as they have been and very personal. And, I, you know, I won't go into too many of them or anything or any of them yeah. really at all. But but that's only up to a point when it's something like this, where I'm reading a text that is describing the nature of the person or persons, if you want to call that. Hmm. Uh, of the of the person who is actually laudable and there's something you can call it spiritual i i mean it to me that's what it is right there is something non-physical happening no different than any other there, there's plenty of things that we experience in life that are non-physical you know mm. like you see a sunset one day and you've seen a thousand of them and it's not a big deal but one day it is a big deal and it really does it, it sits with you in some way that is overwhelming. It is awe-inspiring, you know? And yeah. that's a spiritual thing. That is a revelation. That is, some, that is something being pulled back and showing itself to you that you have an experience. And even if you have experienced it before, you experience it in such a way, in such a dimension, in such a level that is... It, it rejuvenates it gives you life it gives you purpose it, it, even though if even even if it robs words from you in description it's those experiences it's those those glimpses of the divine of the spirit that that should not be dismissed but should be recognized as authentic you know yeah so because it's yeah. the power of that acknowledgement, and I think that's what is overlooked quite a mm. bit. It's like, even though he may not show you, you believing him in him is the power because you are putting your faith into this entity and that it doesn't need, like you're saying, it doesn't need to show itself. Right. Um, because you, as a believer, are supposed to stay a believer, stay in that power of like, I believe in you no matter what. Uh, so, and that goes back to what what he's talking about earlier in this chapter. This idea of conversion, this idea of being childlike, to to convert your hard heart to your closed eyes, to your shut ears, to be open enough to receive those revelations that do come. Whether it's reading a book, whether it's seeing a sunset, whether it's gliding along the ocean, whether it's in the depths of despair, that every demon seems to be stabbing at you suddenly there's something like light that illuminates that that transforms that saves you from the precipice whatever that experience might be for you the necessity of getting the full the, the totality or the fullness of those experiences comes from being like a child being open being innocent being yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Shall we continue? We yeah. shall. <laughs> uh, unforgiving slave. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. <laughs> For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion, released him and forgave him the loan. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a uh, 100 denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him and said, Pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. 
But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into the prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went to report to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all of that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty low. I mean, uh, over a hundred dollars essentially and he just got forgiven ten thousand dollars and he's mm -hmm. being all petty over a hundred dollars that's right like, wow. that's right. <laughs> and so this is this is the function this is a central function of a parable right he just told him a story about this guy who physically owed some money and another guy who owed that guy some money and the consequences of forgiving one you know and being in that state of having been forgiven much and then somebody who in the long and short of it owes him very little but holding him to account and sending him to prison for it and making sure that he extracted every every penny that was owed to him and that the consequences of that that the the master of the one who's forgiven much said well I'm just going to do what you did to that guy you know like you're obviously a wicked selfish prig you know and and he's saying that with money, but he's clearly pointing to the question is, well, what about somebody who sins against me? Not a monetary value, but just if my brother, if some stranger, whoever sins against me, how many times or how much should I forgive him? Right? And the answer that he gives, people say, oh, so it's 490 times. So I can, I can forgive somebody 490 times. They're missing the point. First of all, Seven and zero, or seven and ten, and are, are are numbers of completeness or totality, right? So they're the perfect number. It's not meant to be exactly seven. It's meaning seven times. So seventy times the perfect number, which is totally. In other words, always forgive. That's the amount of times that you ought to forgive. That's not to say that you just roll over and get beat over and over again, right? But it's being willing for those who actually seek out in authenticity and, and desire to be forgiven, you be prepared to forgive. You can, and it's not, the forgiveness is not always, if not even the most important person, is the person who receives the forgiveness. Oftentimes, you yourself being in the position that wants to forgive is going to do so much more for yourself than for that person. Mm -hmm. The hatred, the bitterness, the resentment that can come because somebody's done something wrong and you refuse to let them just, you know, just to forgive them and be willing to say, let's put, let's do bygones, be bygones here. You're, exactly. you're dragging yourself to hell by doing so. Yep. Pretty you know? much. And, and so, and, and so the, the principle isn't just, you know, to be willing to do so and to, 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 to not do that, but it's also a recognition that just like the guy who owed a lot, you know, and, and, you know, was forgiven, we ourselves have done great things that are terrible in our time. We know it. Like, it, it, even the smallest things, we can recognize it being a domino in a chain, you know, that 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 could have gone totally better for another person because we played mm -hmm. a part, you know. Even yep. in that level, we we have a responsibility. We have a, you know, we've done something to that degree. And that's not to beat ourselves up again about it, but it's to recognize that we've been forgiven that, to accept that ourselves, and then to share that 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 forgiveness. So I forgot to mute. <laughs> it's okay. So, yeah, I think it's a, uh, but it, just just to just to show like that's what the parable is doing. It's taking something and applying a spiritual principle to it, right? And uh, 
this is one of the one of the better ones for sure. Yeah, it was a very interesting one for sure. <laughs> Would you? I think that was it, right? I think that was the end of the chapter, yep. yeah. Yep. Has so, it been yeah. two hours already? It has been two hours already. I went by so fast. <laughs> <laughs> we did talk about que it's it's all Coco's fault asking questions. No, I'm just it's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, do, do, you, do you guys have anything else that kind of come up or that you you have a question about or before we go? Because I do, I want to. No, I'm good. Mm -hmm. You want to finish? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I don't want to. I just want don't want to like say, okay, we're done, and then you know, run away or anything like that. But I want to make sure <laughs> if there is anything that that's come up or that you know, there's a pressing question, or even for next time, if there's something you would like to talk about, uh, you know, we can. No, not nothing, not nothing. Any, anything in particular? Um, okay. I like that we go through things um, as we read. Essentially, of course, that makes. <laughs> We would pretty much taking an hour every chapter that normally if you're just by yourself reading it'd take like 10 minutes not even to read through but I, I like discussing it that's why I'm here yeah what one of the <clears throat> one of the things that I disliked and look I, I, I it's funny because like I'm trying to not be a, a, a pastor here you know I'm trying not to necessarily be like a, a preacher by any means I'm trying to do what is essentially exegesis, right? Or a, an extraction of the core values and understanding of what the text says, right? Um, which is more of a teaching thing than it is a preaching thing. Um, yeah, I like that. But I, I always found out mm -hmm. that, that when I went to church, it was just like sometimes I'd be tired. I couldn't focus on what they're saying. There was no real linear progression. It was just, oh, this is what we're talking about today. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, and and I think what and and that's to me what bothered me about going to church. And I'm not saying that people ought not to go to church or or ought to go to church or anything like that. But just the the temperament that I am, clearly, I don't get anything if I can't vocalize. Like I'm, I, I, I know that might sound a bit selfish or anything like that, but I'm never going to be able to go to a church and sit down in a pew and really, really get anything without having some kind of conversation. I don't, <laughs> I don't have to be the one talking the whole time, but I need to voice, Hey, I actually have a question about that. That's kind of messed up or, yeah, you know, exactly. I don't get this, you know, can you, can you that makes sense? Right. And so churches have become so scripted and so uh it's it's you might as well go to like a, a a speech contest like i used to do speech contests when i was a kid right i got i think i got to like provincials or something too at one point when i was a kid and it's just you're talking at people you know and they may or may not even get regardless of the the, the actual religious side of it you know like it could have been like on the, the importance of environmentalism or something like that. I still wouldn't be able to understand. I could not tell you that from the second that thing started to the second that it ended what that speech would have been about. Like anything valuable out of it because I hadn't participated. I hadn't. It, it's not an organic process. The, the greatest, the greatest of the Greek philosophers or one of the greatest anyway, is Socrates. And one of the things that he did and he, he, he impressed upon people is to actually go to the Colosseum and just chat with people. Whatever came up philo uh, philosophically, he would just kind of, oh, well, this is what I understand. What do you think? It's like, well, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, crunch these things. We're going to debate a little bit. We're going to wrestle through the thought and, and kind of get through it. And we've lost that, that whole culture, that whole, you know, that whole foundational ability to just converse with one another whether it's mm. religious or otherwise you know and that that just banks that bankrupts us it's just let's push play on a video and you know that i'm interested in you know have somebody talk at me it's like well wouldn't it be better if i if i wanted to cook if i wanted to learn to cook wouldn't it be great if i just 
sat down with a friend and you know grabbed a couple of pans and some ingredients and said, let's just exactly. cook and figure it out you know <laughs> and that's what church should be that's what anything should be i i want to yeah. learn how to horseshoe i want to i know i want to learn how to fly and or build and fly a kite i don't care what it is you know let's do it in a way that is organic and reasonable not so detached and terrible which is exactly. what is what my experience with church is it's just it's I'd so say awful it, almost education in general is yeah. sort of that way it's like <laughs> let's all sit in a classroom we'll talk about this thing in the book and then we'll put a video on for you to watch yeah <laughs> my best my best experience with church was with the men's group and we did something called Conquer Series, which had to do with sexual addiction and, and stuff like that. So, you know, pornography, basically pornography, you know, and trying to overcome whether it's right or wrong is besides the fact people just felt like we don't want this in our lives anymore. Right. And so basically a bunch of dudes sitting down and working through a little workbook, but really being real with one another and saying, hey, this is what we have going in our lives, even if it had nothing to do with that topic. So this is what we had going in our lives and how you can pray and how we can work together. And hey, you need somebody to come over once in a while and just, you know, help out, you know, whatever it was. And that was the best experience. And that's what church really should be. You know, a community that just holds one another accountable, praises with one another and, you know, uh, you know, cries with one another if we have to, if, if that's the circumstances, right? And that's, uh, and so this, this is my attempt to do something, hopefully, you know, just educational, whether it's just information wise or a, an encouragement to look into things that are beyond yourself, you know, I, that's, that's what I hope to do. I know youth pastors are using D and D sometimes to talk about making good decisions. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think D and D would be really cool with a youth group. We did we played it in uh, in college, which was kind of fun. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I definitely I like it because it does put you in that. Well, you got to make a moral decision here. That we're pretending these are real people right now. We're role playing. Yeah, That's essentially what D and D is. You're role playing. <laughs> yeah, I think that, I think that yeah. Good. Sorry. I said that world that that word role playing just has like many connotations like especially in like a professional s setting training where we're role playing the situation that you'd be in how would you react kind of mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. D, D is is fun to me in that way yeah yeah I think it also prepares you for kind of like what Jade is talking about too right it's like it prepares you for social experiences that you might never actually encounter but are still <clears throat> they bring questions you know they they force you into a, a position to place yourself into a position where you do think of the moral consequences or the you know the social interaction you know like i was a very very shy kid you know like i I was also a very sensitive kid, you know, uh, you're probably more shy than me, but I was always probably. more, I think I was more sensitive than you. Like I would drop, I would cry at the drop of the hat. I'm still pretty sensitive, even though I probably don't come off that way. Like, you know, going to jail and stuff really helps you toughen the hell up kind of thing, but <laughs> you know, but uh, practice makes permanent. Exactly. You know, but like, like D and D is the first thing that allowed me to like socially be able to engage with people and come out of my shell kind of thing so that was uh it was very very helpful for me i, I like that practice makes permanent i haven't heard it that before so mm -hmm. i don't like practice makes perfect either i like practice makes improvement that that's mm. that's a true statement mm -hmm. yeah, no, yeah nothing nothing's perfect you can strive for perf perfection but right. like i mean no one's perfect <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i guarantee you i can still ride a bike mm -hmm. even though i haven't ridden a bike in 20 yeah. years <laughs> i guarantee you i could jump on a bike right now and i will do it why because practice made permanent <laughs> so yeah there you go i like that yeah hmm. it's good well with all that said guys i really appreciate you being here um i uh i expect us to continue forth uh next week on sunday so uh we've been doing it at two has it been two or two thirty 2.30 my time, so it'll be, what is that, 
12, basically 12.30 Central, if I remember correctly. Right? So, and uh, yeah, I've been enjoying it. Hopefully you guys have been enjoying it too. Thanks for uh, the fellow who came in and talked about Charlie Kirk for a second. That was entertaining <laughs> to me. <laughs> So and I, I wasn't trying to be rude or mean about it either. I'm just like, I, uh, I, he was being rude. <laughs> I, maybe like, I, you know, I was trying to try to just veer it off this way. It's like, oh, uh, thanks. You handled it perfectly. Thanks. But, I appreciate yeah, you. It, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's 12 central time. Yeah. Um, the time that we usually start. Oh, is it 12 central? Yeah. I'm, okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 12 central. I'm, I'm ready by one. Right. Time. That's right. That's right. So, uh. <clears throat> yeah, and of course, if anybody uh, has any questions, has anything uh, topic-wise in terms of the Bible or theology or anything like that um, that you'd like me to look into or talk about, or, you know, I'm not trying to give necessarily my opinion, although <laughs> obviously I'm talking and therefore it's 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 going to filter through this very strange experience that I have as a human being. Um, exactly. like your friendly neighborhood ex-con, ex-atheist, and exactly what the doctor ordered. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, of course, I uh, I want to I want to serve everybody and I, I want to de- give a decent um, response as well. So um, yeah, I if it's something that I don't know about, I am the first person to say, hmm, I don't know about I don't know about this part. And uh, but I'm also the type of person who will try and figure it out. So uh that's what i hopefully i can bring to the table so and i of course love that uh, adam yellowhammer 503 and my dear sibling lunar smiles can join me when they can join me so until yep. next time thank you one more time and uh hopefully we'll see you again <laughs> all right see you guys <laughs>